I'm Jim McEwen from the University of Wisconsin and I'm going to be talking about my own personal experience of textual criticism in establishing a text of Ovid's Amores to accompany my commentary on the poems. But before I start, I'd like to make a general observation on the significance of textual criticism. The beginning of Herodotus' histories is one of the most famous passages in classical literature. If you ask a classicist about the first sentence in the first book, they'll pretty certainly assure you that it begins of Herodotus, of Halicarnassus. This is the declaration of his inquiries into the causes of the Persian Wars and so on. Well, of course, that's what it says. Everyone knows that Herodotus came from Halicarnassus, so how could the work start otherwise? Well, in fact, let's check. What's the most convenient method that most people use for checking references nowadays? We go online to the TLG, the Thesaurus Linguae Graecae, either directly or through Diogenes. And what do we find? Herodotus apparently did not write of Herodotus of Halicarnassus. He wrote of Herodotus of Thurii. So what's going on? Well, we aren't seeing the full picture. Here's what we find in the Bude edition of Herodotus. According to the editor, he did in fact write of Herodotus of Thurii. But now look at the Apparatus Criticus. For there we find that none of the manuscripts actually mention Thurii at all. They all give in various forms the word Halicarnassus. Thurii only appears in quotations by Aristotle and Plutarch. The point of making is obvious. We need to know when there is more than one reading on offer. To accept just one reading without being alerted to the possibility of doubt about it, that puts us back into medieval times when a scholar might feel grateful to have access to even one manuscript. Surely these days we can do better than that. And of course, it's not a problem just with Greek. Suppose, for argument's sake, we wanted to find out what Ovid wrote in a particular line of the Amores. Here's 1221. If we look in the Latin library, a very popular online resource, we'll find that at Amores 1221, Ovid wrote, Nil opus est bello, veniam pacemque rogamus. There's no need for war, we ask for pardon and peace. There's nothing very suspicious about that. It makes sense and it scans. What more could we ask? Well, since I'll be coming back to this line repeatedly as an illustration of issues involved in textual criticism, I'd like to establish right now that it's not what Ovid wrote. What Ovid actually wrote was nil opus est bello, pacem veniamque rogamus, i.e. not pardon and peace, but peace and pardon. Here's my note on the passage, which I hope gives definitive proof of this. Pacem veniamque echoes a solemn prayer formula, whereas veniam pacemque seems never to appear anywhere. In other words, it's a bit like saying it's raining dogs and cats instead of it's raining cats and dogs. There's nothing actually wrong with it. It's just not right. Another thing, starting with pacem, gives a neat contrast with bello at the end of the phrase nil opus est bello. Now here's the interesting point. When we look at the manuscript evidence, we'll find that there's at least as much testimony for the order pacem veniamque as for veniam pacemque. So isn't it a pity that restricting ourselves to just one version, as in the Latin library, we're cutting ourselves off from making a properly informed decision about the reading? Now, the point I'm making is, I hope, clear enough. We need the evidence that textual criticism can provide and since there's not much prospect that scholars 
are going to stop using the great convenience of electronic research. It's important that an apparatus criticus should be available whenever we search for a particular text online. But to turn now to my actual topic, I want to talk about my own experiences in preparing my text of Ovid's Amores. I'm going to start by talking about the preparatory work needed for gathering textual evidence. Then I'll talk about collation, which means finding out and recording what each individual manuscript tells us at any given point in the text. Then I'll talk briefly about how one might go about analysing this evidence. And finally, I'll say something about what I might do differently if I repeated the whole process. In that last section, it's not so much that I feel I did things wrongly as that I could have done them more efficiently. Most editors of texts are editing their first text, so textual criticism is a skill we pick up as we're doing it. So inevitably, there are things we might do differently second time round. The first thing to do is to get access to the manuscripts. There are several ways to do this either through the use of microfilms or photographs or by autopsy. That's to say, going to see the manuscript in the library or other institution where it's kept. Nowadays, some manuscripts are available online, but they're still very sporadic, and so I'll not be saying anything about that. I was lucky to have quite a few microfilms and photographs ready to hand because they'd been passed on to me by Ted Kenny, the editor of the Oxford text of Ovid's Amatory Poetry. A great benefit of having a good number of manuscripts available from the very start is that it allows an editor to make comparison on particular points over several manuscripts straight away. As well as the manuscripts that I, as it were, inherited, I also obtain some of my own. It's easy enough to write to institutions asking for copies of manuscripts in their holdings. Microfilms aren't as convenient to use as photographs. Now, I'll always be grateful to the librarian at the Pierpoint Morgan Library in New York. I wrote asking for photographs of their Ovid manuscript of the Amores and got a very considerate letter back from the librarian. She pointed out to me that photographs would be extremely expensive and that their manuscript was of a good enough quality that microfilm would be perfectly adequate. That's the sort of thing that an inexperienced editor just doesn't know. But by and large, the best thing is to visit the institutions that hold the manuscripts that you need to read, for autopsy can provide information that photographs and microfilms just can't. And since getting access to manuscripts can be quite an elaborate process, I would suggest writing to the institution in advance when I first went to the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, even though I sent a letter in advance, I was interviewed by seven different people before I got to see the oldest manuscript of the Amores. I was warned in advance that this was the procedure. It wasn't because I looked particularly suspicious. And in any case, once I got into the reading room, the wonderful manuscript was brought to me very, very quickly. Even for someone who's not actually editing a text, acquaintance with manuscripts is a very enlightening experience. What do manuscripts actually look like? Well, here are some famous and top of the range examples. This is a papyrus of Gallus, the um, earliest of the great Augustan elegists. It was almost certainly copied in the 20s BC and it's no way typical for it's a papyrus. It's not a manuscript, uh, but everybody should know about it. Uh, if there were any doubt that this was by Gallus, we can see that his mistress, Lycoris, is named in the first line, and there are many other things of interest as well. In the first full line, cum, which we know in classical Latin as C-U-M, it's written Q-U-O-M. So that should be enough to shatter any illusions we may have that our Latin orthography is anything like the original. 
Here's the earliest illustrated Latin manuscript. It's one of the Virgil texts in the Vatican. And on it, we can see Lao Koon and his sons being strangled by snakes. But in textual terms, it's more interesting to read the lines themselves. And you may like to look at your leisure at the last two uh, lines of the text immediately above the illustration. For there you'll spot at least two errors, readings that couldn't go back to Virgil himself. Now, moving on several centuries from Virgil in the fifth century, here are some lines from the Beatitudes as copied in the Book of Kells in Trinity College, Dublin. You should be able to make out the first two lines. Beati paupere spiritu quaniam ipsorum est regnum caelorum. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There's one word there that's not written out in full. It's spiritu, uh, which appears as little more than S-P-U. This is a typical abbreviation. Uh, because it's a word that was particularly common in uh, Christian texts, it was more than usually susceptible to abbreviation. And as the centuries went by, abbreviations loom larger and larger among the challenges facing the paleographer. Now here, very quickly, is the opening page of a manuscript of Ovid's Metamorphoses. It's extremely beautiful and it's also extremely easy to read. And again, here's another very lovely artifact. It tells the story of the Persian Emperor Shapur uh, using the Roman Emperor Valerian as a mounting block for getting on his horse. There are two salient points about this manuscript and the illustration. Shapur captured Valerian in 260 AD, but he and his courtiers are gotten up like French nobles of more than a thousand years later, and Shapur is using stirrups, which were unknown in the West in antiquity. Ignorance about or indifference to anachronism has considerable implications, not just for illustrations, but for the actual recording of texts themselves. It's worth observing that this particular text is written in French, not Latin. Until printing reached the West in the 15th century, it wasn't just Latin, but any vernacular language as well that had to be handwritten. Now, that's enough about spectacular manuscripts. The actual reality of reading manuscripts in preparing an edition tends to be rather different and much less glamorous.